Hi, Leif. Nice to see you here over Zoom. The last time I spoke with you was about your album uh, Mozart Momentum 1786 back in the spring. Uh, so it's finally so nice to meet and see you here over Zoom. Thanks. Likewise. Mm -hmm. uh, I first want, first of all, I want to thank you for introducing me to these wonderful pieces by Dvorak, his poetic tome pictures. They are really, really great. Uh, I've been programming them here at the station since I got my hands on the tracks from Crossover. 13 gems by Dvorak. They're, they're really fantastic pieces. I guess my first question is, why have I never heard of them before? And uh, why do you think they are so unduly overlooked? Um. Well, it's very curious, but he has a reputation of not being able to write well for the piano. Um, it derives from the fact that he was not a pianist. He was a string player. He was an amateur organ player, but he didn't own a piano until he was 40 or something, I think. Um, and yes, there are some awkward moments when you play these pieces. It, the, the, it's not as physically natural for the hands to do the things they're being asked as as when you play a piece by, by Chopin or Schumann or Debussy. But um, on the other hand, he writes so colorfully, so wonderfully uh, for the piano, so full of different textures for each piece and, mm -hmm. and different technical challenges as well as, as, as the music, which is, of course, glorious. I mean, this is written around the best time of Dvorak, around the Eighth Symphony and the Piano Quintet and the Requiem. And, um, and it's it's just a miracle to find this kind of thing which people don't really play. I mean, some Czech pianists play it, but even in, I played this, this cycle now three or four, three, four weeks ago in Prague, and they say that, you know, for them, it's not standard repertoire, even for them. <laughs> so, um, yeah. So how, how are you first introduced to them? It's, it's very strange, but I've known <laughs> at least some of them since I was a child, because my father picked up quite rather ra randomly in London, an LP of these pieces with the Czech pianist Radoslav Kvapil. And I remember listening to, to, to the first ones when I was a child and I liked them very much. And I played the very first one in the youth competition when I was 12. Um, later on in my twenties, I played a group of them in recitals and it's been in the back of my head that, you know, I should look at more of them. Um, and then I found a few years ago, a, a quote from Dvorak who said that, uh, only by playing all of the pieces together could can one really understand my intention. Um, and I thought that's really quite an ambitious statement. You know, the, the, a piano cycle of almost an hour. I mean, in, in the nineteenth century, that was not not really normal. It's like twice mm -hmm. the length twice the length of of the great Schumann cycles or the pictures at an exhibition of Mussorgsky or something like that. Um, but it got me very curious and, and when the pandemic was over us, then, then I, I thought maybe that's one of the things I should study. Now I have a bit more time at home. And, uh, so I did and a great discovery, I think for me. Yeah. I mean, when I was listening to them, I was thinking they're all four or five minutes long. I mean, you could play three or four of them on a, on a recital or maybe sure. one, one is a piano encore. But uh, you really think that all 13 of them should just be played, you know, as, as a complete cycle, right? Oh, I mean, they can absolutely be played individually or, 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 in, or in a group. I, I often play, you know, them as, uh, some of them as encores after concerto performances, for instance. And, mm -hmm. uh, but um, I, I mean, piece like, a piece like the Spring Song number four, so it's very appealing, like an encore. Um, but I think it's a very special feeling to play them all as a cycle. Mm -hmm. um, I do understand what Dvorak meant. And it's not because there are necessarily, you know, strong connections between the pieces. So you see something coming back from number four to number seven or so. But it's it's it makes for such a contrasting journey um, between very sort of spiritual or mysterious pieces and other very playful ones and the Czech dances and, and virtuosic pieces and very intimate ones. And then at the end, um, the last two pieces sort of zooms in uh, to something very serious. You have at the hero's grave, which is, which is heroic, but very serious and sad. 
and then you have the last piece which is which is like a big prayer you know it's on a holy mountain, mountain yeah. uh and very very beautiful ending to it like a big farewell to to what we've been through and it makes we us all feel like we've been through this great journey mm-hmm. um and uh, so I, I i think the feeling of doing them now i i just did 13 recitals in europe and i'm continuing with with almost as many in the states in January, uh, with with playing them as a second half uh, in the concerts, and it's I love the the way it feels at the end when we've been through it all. Yeah, and when you've seen all when you've seen all of all of the pictures, mm-hmm. mm. uh, they were written in the spring of uh, eighteen eighty nine, uh, and they all had these descriptive titles: the Goblin's Dance, Tittle Tattle, uh, etc. I myself am a big fan of the Dvorak orchestral tone poems, which were all written after uh, these uh, poetic uh, tone pictures. Why do you think Dvorak started moving away to from formal music composition and more towards sort of painting a picture and telling a story in his music? Hmm. Well, he had, he had different transitions in his life. He was also early on harmonically much more Wagnerian and mm-hmm. um, very advanced uh, and and much less of the sort of simple appealing melodic qualities that we identify with him um, so he, and then he got closer to the folk music and started using that and then as you say at a certain point around this time of writing these pieces he gets into programmatic music and the eighth symphony which is written around the same time was supposed was first supposed to be a real uh, have a real program and then in the end it became more of an absolute you know symphony um but yeah that seemed to be really what what sparked his interest at, at that time whether he was working on also operatic things so or, or but he was really um i feel with the with this idea the piano music changes because the earlier piano music some of it is it's very good, but it doesn't have the same attraction. It doesn't have the same freedom of expression. So he found something there, um, which um, I think for me then is on a higher level. I wouldn't say that in general with this music, but certainly for the piano music, then uh, it, it develops. Mm-hmm. Uh, you say in the booklet, it's a cycle of many stories, but it also feels like one big story. Uh, it, it feels like is this, you're opening a book and saying, listen, I'm going to tell you something. What is the bigger story? Do you know? Oh, I don't know. I think maybe <laughs> it's just 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 a picture of Czech life and, and culture uh, at the time. Um, you know, like you have uh, in Schmetana's Mablast, you know, the, the big the big orchestral piece. Um, mm. Something like that. Um, but I don't think there's a big a bigger meaning or a bigger story as such. I just mm-hmm. think he he felt that really to 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 experience the 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 wealth of his ideas, you know, one 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 needed to hear them all. I mean, um, uh, and uh, and it does something when you when you spend some time um, with one world, and that's what I think the the first piece. When it starts with these broken chords, it's it's really like opening a book, and you Actually, want to be you want to be inside there. You want to be there where it happens. It's so personal. Yeah, and- actually, the first time I heard the the uh, the Twilight Way, it reminded me of the opening of Schumann's Kinderszenen. I know yes. Dvorak didn't want them to be like Schumann, but it reminded me so much of the Kinderszenen. It was uh, for me unmistakable. Uh, mm, the, that's the, 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 wonderful yeah i mean uh, I, I i think that that that's the root of course i mean it comes from there and and for me it, it i do understand what you mean because i mean because emotionally it has the same effect doesn't it that the, yeah it's sort of like so personal. Let me, yeah let yeah. me tell you a story and and here we go and then you've got and this, the story is really eye to eye it's it's between two persons it's it's mm-hmm. not something um i mean beethoven when he tells a story it's like more of giving a speech in a way maybe but 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 this is a very personal one between two persons uh, and yeah and one of the one of the other one of the other pieces i found so interesting uh, was the sorrowful reverie uh, the sixth mm-hmm. piece and yeah. 
for me, I was listening and I was thinking, is that a tango? Like it's, <laughs> it, it's it, it, it has these, it has these tango rhythms that I found just like, wow, that's crazy. <laughs> it's, it's really, uh, it, it really has the rhythm of tango in the accompaniments, all, yeah. all true. And the, and the melodic line could be, could be a very central tango. Uh, mm. though it doesn't sound South American or anything, but, yeah. but it's, but it's, it, it, it is a strange mixture of things. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, you've touched on it, uh, earlier, uh, but I just want to hone in on it. Dvorak wasn't a pianist. Uh, were there any, are there any moments in particular where you just looked at the pieces and went, whoa, this is written completely unidiomatically for the for the piano like are, are there any pieces of parts of the pieces that pop, mm. pop out there there are certain passages um not so much whole pieces but the certain passages in the fifth piece in the peasants ballad um uh, the, there are some 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 passages of thirds and and uh and chordal things which are very awkward um in the uh, here at the hero's grave there are strange, sometimes strange piano writing, sometimes also fascinatingly strange. They sound differently, but but sometimes um, you think, why why would he put all that in the right hand when you can do part of it in the <laughs> left hand? Or, or why wouldn't you use more chords than just a single line? I mean, you know, he has also piano concerto, which is very rarely played. And I think that does pose some problems in in the balance with the orchestra because he uses very often a single line in the in the treble uh, i mean brahms would have where brahms would have used chords or right um so you 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 feel like he's almost writing for a single violin uh rather than for the piano um but it's i love that piece. i happen to love that piece too even if i don't play it um but but this, of course, here is no balance problems. I'm alone, so you yeah, don't right. have the you don't have these kind of problems. But but you do sometimes wonder why he wrote in the way he 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 wrote. It's here and there. Um, mm -hmm. It's mixed because, as I said, there are other places where I I do find wow. I mean, how wonderful it sounds, you know, and how original sometimes. Uh, in the mm -hmm. second piece called Toying, I just find it so interesting with all these chords with short notes and then the mm -hmm. Then there is a middle section which is so fluid, like Schubert. They're like yeah. like a, like a river, and and it's at the same time unmistakably Dvorak uh, in 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 the way it sounds. And I think you know that was sort of a very special piano style that he found. Mm -hmm. uh, we're almost out of time. I'm going to wrap the uh, conversation up this way. Uh, how does it feel to be championing these uh, thirteen pieces? And more importantly, when are you going to come to Canada and specifically Winnipeg? To <laughs> uh, I'd, I'd love to come to Canada and uh, I'm playing in Toronto in this uh, coming uh, recital tour in North America in um, in January that's unfortunately my only Canadian date this uh -huh. the, this time and and it does feel wonderful to play these Torshak pieces I have to say it's a great great joy um, and um, and audiences are really reacting to them uh i think also they are so immediately appealing because of their melodic uh you know attraction and and, and all that and so um great job of course uh leif this has just been so much fun it's been wonderful discovering this new music of dvorak uh thanks for recording this these pieces so well and thank, <clears throat> thanks for taking the time to chat with me today thanks great pleasure <laughs>